Daniel Rosenberg, who's a thought leader in the field of understanding the underpinnings of microadenomas, which as everyone knows, may know, it's progressed to, can progress to become invasive cancer. And we, it would be a key un, way to understand how we can prevent invasive metastatic colon cancer in the future. Colon cancer, too often we already diagnose it maybe 60% of the time when it's already invasive. And so uh, what he can learn can inform immunotherapy for the future and maybe new prevention strategies. So take it away, Daniel. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. I, I was lost for about five or 10 minutes. So uh, thank you, Lance, uh, Claudia, Wendy, every uh, Unre for inviting me to this session. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, inflammatory signaling pathways uh, that we've been uncovering in early neoplasia in our laboratory over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, using a combination of LCM with different uh, downstream uh, technologies. Uh, so we're interested in the part of endoscopy that really occurs below five millimeters in size of lesion. And these are not lesions that can really be seen by conventional endoscopy. Uh, so your, your typical colonoscopy won't pick up uh, what we refer to as these aberrant crypt foci or microadenomas in some cases. Uh, they're very, very small. The samples that we collect usually are less than several millimeters in size. And that necessitates the use of the very, very sensitive technologies in order to study uh, what these lesions are um, doing. So the case for the precancer genome atlas, which is sort of the, the, the sister of the TCGA, uh, was put out by the NCI about five years ago. Uh, and it's a histologic and, and multiomic mapping strategy that, that will be able to define many of the characteristics of these pre-malignant lesions and how they may evolve to invasive cancers. I was at a, a think tank down at NCI a few years ago, and quite a few people sat around a table trying to decide what, what lesions, what tissue types should be included in the PCGA. Um, it, breast, obviously, colon, esophagus, lung, the, the pancreas. But the problem is that prostate, that uh, once you remove the lesion, it's in many cases, it's difficult to tell whether, whether what, if, what its biological outcome is going to be. So this is really a, a major challenge of studying early neoplasia. Um, is once you remove the lesion, there's no understanding or prediction of where the lesion will go. So our interest in early neoplasia in the colon began really back in the, in the late 80s when Rajana Bird in Canada identified in a rat model this funny staining area of colon in a, a resected colon that she referred to as an aberrant crypt foci. And Based on that and my interest in mouse strain uh, differential sensitivities to a colon carcinogen uh, that is known as, uh, that is called azoxymethane, uh, I will review this, this first study that really brought us uh, together to the field of, of prediction and also using sensitive methods like laser capture to learn more about what early lesion uh, information might be contained in early lesions. So just to understand the slide, uh, you need to know that on the left side are the two different strains of mice that we had been studying for quite a few years. One is the AKR strain and the other is a strain A or AJ mouse. And both strains when given carcinogen would develop aberrant crypt foci, those early neoplastic lesions, preneoplastic lesions. But 30 weeks later, only the AJ strain progressed to cancer. The AKR strain remained resistant. And there's several other strains that have this, these sort of uh, resistant or sensitive characteristics uh, in addition to AKR and A, but these two are, are really the ones that we studied most intensively. So in this study, which really launched our colon cancer prevention program, we tested Prashant Nambiar, who was a postdoc in the lab, he was a veterinary pathologist, 
uh, decided to test both conventional immunohistology uh, using a series of um, uh, cancer biomarkers on the left to see whether he could distinguish this, these early preneoplastic changes uh, prior to, to tumor formation and see whether he could determine a difference in the, in the likelihood of progression. Using conventional immunohistology, he really didn't see any differences in P53, cyclin D1, CMIC, APC, uh, beta catenin, some of the standard markers you would, you, would, you would look at in the colon. However, he then decided to microdissect, laser capture microdissect uh, lesions from the sensitive and resistant strains and see whether or not there may be uh, genetic differences uh, identified by, by gene expression profile. And this is before the, the development of uh, uh, Illumina and Affymetrix. So these were homemade cDNA microarrays that were made uh, and tested. And using these cDNA arrays, we actually found that there were a number of genes that were upregulated and a number of genes that were downregulated differentially in the sensitive resistant strains, telling us that, that there's a lot of genetic information already at this pre-malignant stage. So do these ACF have prognostic value? And why are we interested in them? Well, we're interested in them, and we've collected 4,500 of these lesions from human colons now over the last decade and stored them at minus 80 in, uh, in uh, OCT. So I hope that they have some, some value. Uh, we think they might offer a surrogate marker for cancer prevention, perhaps provide some additional risk stratification for advanced neoplasia, but a technical challenge, as I've mentioned, is they're extremely small size. So we really need to use uh, highly sensitive technologies to, to uh, interrogate these. Uh, this is now moving into the, the domain of the human colon. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit easier to visualize in a mouse colon, uh, considering it's, it's a little bit larger than a mouse colon. Uh, but this is an endoscopic image on the left of using methylene blue in high definition chromoendoscopy. And on the right is using indigo carmine, which is the dye that we now use almost exclusively for our human studies. And you can see the arrow pointing out several very small, several millimeter size lesions uh, within the folds of uh, the, the, upper, the upper colon on the left and the distal colon on the right. So you could see how small these lesions are. But the question is, are they, are they precursor lesions to cancer? So... There are two known pathways that have been well described. Of course, the, the traditional Vogelstein, Bird Vogelstein adenoma carcinoma sequence on the left, which uh, goes through a microadenoma phase through traditional adenomas to form an invasive colorectal cancer. Whereas Jeremy Jass, about 15 years ago, uh, a pathologist from uh, Canada, from Toronto, identified what he called the alternative pathway. And probably up about 20 to 25% of colorectal cancers go through this alternative pathway, which involves a different set of genetic alterations, including a BRAF mutation or KRAS, uh, DNA methylation alterations, as well as microsatellite instability. And it eventually progresses through serrated polyps in the proximal colon, and then a, a histologically similar type of uh, adenocarcinoma that you end up with from the traditional pathway. The question is, and I boxed it out, does this, the, the ACF or the very, very small microadenoma play a role in these pathways or are they just dead ends that don't go anywhere? So to study some of these things and find out what's going on in the ACF, we started using, and this is a uh, Arturus XT, a, a, a later um, laser capture instrument that um, of course, uh, you know, Lance had, had been instrumental in, in developing all this technology over the years and, uh, and, and moving it into so many different directions. Uh, so this is actually uh, boxing out an area of a uh, probably a serrated hyperplastic ACF. So it's, it's got a lot of hyperplasia in it, and you can see the star-shaped uh, appearance of it. To the upper left of, the, of that slide, we see uh, normal crypts. And marking up these lesions into four different groupings, uh, we can actually separate epithelial cells as well, or, 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 or groups of cells and stromal cells, groups of cells, into distinct areas of capture that we can then study. 
And doing this, we've, we've developed a number of different uh, omics approaches to study these early neoplastic lesions, beginning at the top where we use the high definition chromoendoscopy on the left to see an ACF, on the right to see an, the, the sessile serrated adenoma in the proximal colon, which is a preneoplastic lesion that we are, or a precancerous lesion that we are very, very interested in. And the first thing we'll do is some limited pathology and genomics to, to sort of identify at least the pathway we're studying. Uh, then we collect the biopsy sample. In some cases, we make organoid cultures. Uh, then we embed the, the, the remaining material in OCT and then do our laser capture. And some of the different approaches that we've used over the years are shown below. Uh, we, we published a paper in Oncogene several years ago doing a uh, RRBS or DNA methylation profiling of these lesions. Um, we've also done, I'll show you very briefly, some, uh, some uh, proteomics we've done uh, on these lesions. Uh, and, and then a number of other targeted RNA sequencing applications. And, and actually, uh, now we're, we're, we're starting to work on um, doing some Cytoff analysis uh, of these lesions that uh, Lance had mentioned as well. So, in, in, in back in 2017, uh, I'm sorry, 2007, we published a paper in Cancer Research uh, in which we looked at, at these ACF lesions and we identified two different hyperplastic lesions in the distal colon the distended ACF at the top left and the serrated ACF. And using Sanger sequencing, we, uh, we looked at KRAS and BRAF mutations. And what we found in this study was that there, the, while KRAS was equally distributed between the serrated and distended lesions, the BRAF mutation was entirely uh, present, almost entirely present within the serrated ACF, which would be consistent with the Jeremy Jass pathway. Uh, we were a little, we were, we were wondering whether or not they both might signal equivalently through ERK. So what we did is at this time, we, a, a company called uh, Nanopro, which is now Protein Simple, developed a nanofluidic method for, for looking at very, very small numbers of cells. So we worked very hard and we were able to, to laser capture these lesions, isolate protein lysates and put them onto this, uh, onto this uh, a nanofluidic uh, system where we could look at six states of ERK1 and ERK2. So single, non-phosphorylated, single, and double phosphorylated. And at the end of the study, which was published in Proteomics in 2013, we found that all the ACF had fairly equivalent levels of ERK phosphorylation, despite whether or not they had a RAF, a BRAF, or a KRAS mutation. So somehow ERK was being activated, but it wasn't necessarily or exclusively through an ERK or, or RAS mutation. Following that, David Drew, who had done that original study, David was a graduate student in the lab um, at the time. He's now a assistant professor up at Mass General. And David uh, was really interested in these lesions. And we decided we wanted to look at greater detail at, at genomically at what was going on in these lesions, other than just RAS and RAF. And so David looked at an, an AP, APC mutations, he, he, and he was able, using Sanger sequencing, to identify a fairly novel APC R876 somatic mutation in a proximal ACF. So these are ACF that are in the upper colon or the right colon. And at first we thought we might have identified a, an APC kindred. So David looked at the same mutation in, this, in not only dysplastic ACF or microadenomas, but in whole blood and in three different synchronous tubular adenomas. And the only uh, lesion that had, the, had this mutation was the dysplastic ACF, indicating it was a somatically acquired uh, genetic alteration, not a, uh, an FAP uh, patient. Uh, he also confirmed that the, uh, the APC R876 had a functional change by looking at uh, immunohistology of, of beta-catenin, which is the, the main readout for an APC mutation. So this is a, a rare mutation. The, it's only about two and a half percent of uh, of colorectal cancers with APC mutations. However, it's a very aggressive uh, lesion that causes uh, invasive colorectal cancer. So, would we recommend this for every patient that comes through? No, obviously not. But in in this case, we certainly uh, provided some benefit to a person uh, by removing the.
So David then developed a, a customized DNA MS panel make, uh, made by Sequinome, uh, which we developed uh, together with Sequinome. Uh, and this panel uh, identifies about 115 different uh, hotspot mutations that are associated with colorectal cancer. And this has all been published in 2018 in Molecular Cancer Research. And what, what we found when we interrogated the, the distended and serrated ACF, as well as the dysplastic ACF, all in the proximal colon, was that all APC mutations were found in dysplastic ACF. The BRAF V600E, which is really the main uh, BRAF mutation, uh, was found only primarily in the, in the serrated lesions. And this was actually the first report of an ERB2 and NRAS mutation found in human ACF. NRAS actually is fairly infrequent in colon cancer, but when it is present, it tends to be uh, associated with very aggressive cancers. So about the time that David was in his last year of graduate school, uh, Alan Moe, an MD-PhD student, joined the lab. And Alan wanted to go beyond the, the sequinome and uh, genomic anal uh, genetic analysis to, to, to look at targeted transcriptomics. So we started working with Thermo Fisher at this time uh, to use some of their targeted AmpliSeq approaches. And uh, the experimental design was to go from LCM to targeted RNA sequencing. And what, what Alan did is first we looked to, in, at, at a, a number of hyperplastic dis, distal colon lesions. And Alan was able to find significant expression differences between epithelial cells and in, in, in the underlying stroma shown by these PCA plots. So we could really see differences in expression patterns. Uh, the, there were oncogenic mutations that activated distinct transcriptional profiles. And we were very, very interested in this because we found that a KRAS or BRAF mutation in this heat map, heat map on the left clearly produced the different signals than an APC mutation in these small lesions. And by uh, GSEA, we found that the APC mutations did activate pathways consistent with what you would expect from an APC mutation. KRAS and BRAF, the same. They activated uh, predicted predictive uh, signaling pathways. So, so clearly we found that by targeting the LCM combined with targeting uh, RNA sequencing, we could actually distinguish based on a somatic mutation uh, downstream signaling events. And I'll, I'll add that that the BRAF and KRAS are mutually exclusive in our hands. We've never seen uh, evidence of one or the other. We also don't see APC when we see KRAS or BRAF at this early stage of cancer. Uh, of pre preneoplasia, uh, we also found that KRS and BRAF themselves were are transcriptionally distinct, and in fact, the BRAF mutant le uh, lesion uh, was seemed to be re restricted. I'm, I'm sorry, the 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 um, P16 or or uh, CDK N2A seemed to be only associated with uh, the BRAF mutation. And you can see that uh, both by a, um, a, a Z-score Z transformation plot heat map on the left in order to see things more clearly, and then by our bar graph on the right, where the BRAF mutant ACF had the P16 up regulation. We thought this in the epithelium might actually activate some sort of a uh, apoptotic or senescent uh, checkpoint that inhibits the progression of these lesions. Um, we also looked at the stroma in this study, and we this is all looking on the left at pro-inflammatory genes that were upregulated. And then in the right, we actually looked at a number of different fibroblast-related genes. And it looked as if uh, something was going on in a very interesting manner in the, stro the stromal fibroblasts surrounding these ACF lesions. And so we did some immunofluorescence uh, analysis, and we actually found that uh, that we were starting to see an activation of our expression of alpha SMA, which is suggestive of a cancer associated fibroblast or a CAF. We're not going to call these CAFs at this point because this is so early in neoplasia that it's unlikely that that sort of a phenotype could have been acquired. But something is clearly going on within the fibroblast uh, at this point. Uh, a very interesting study was published from the uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute from Wayne, uh, William Grady, 
uh, about two years ago, looking at activated fibroblasts in the AC, in the stroma, uh, not the ACF stroma, but in in the stroma of the epithelium around uh, uh, colorectal cancers. And uh, uh, Dr. Grady suggested that oxidative stress or DNA damage may drop within the epithelial layer may drive the activation of senescent fibroblasts, and these would be. Uh, what we call SASPs or senescence associated secretory phenotype fibroblasts that go into a senescence program but begin to secrete a lot of uh, uh, a proliferative signals from the stroma driving the epithelium. Dr. Grady suggested that GDF15 or a growth differentiation factor 15 might be causing a lot of the epithelial changes going on. I would also add to the GDF15, which we haven't looked at yet that other things might be driving it, such as dietary factors, and also likely microbiota. So in the next uh, few slides, I'm just gonna show you some work we've done on looking at how adherence might be driving some of the inflammatory changes that we're seeing at this early stage of neoplasia. Uh, okay, can everybody hear me? Good. So. Uh, in the next few slides, I will show you some work that was done uh, that has been ongoing with Dr. George Weinstock. Uh, George joined the Jackson Labs, which built a, uh, a, uh, one of their campuses on, on our, uh, on our um, UConn uh, Health Center site. And so it was very fortunate that George came in at just about the time that I was interested in microbiome. And so together with several postdocs in his laboratory, Bo Young and Dong Bin, uh, we did the following study. Um, we, we looked at adherent microbiota. These would be microbiome that are actually growing within the, uh, both the epithelial layer as well as adjacent, immediately adjacent to the uh, epithelial layer. And what we found in this study, which was published in Nature Precision Oncology last two years ago, uh, was that using a, a probe, a fish probe, we found that uh, that ACF lesions in the proximal colon or microadenomas uh, actually were beginning to adhere fairly large amounts of, of bacterial colonization, which you can see with the red dots. And a question which uh, you know we've thought about and uh, Claudia and I actually were talking about is how one studies these tiny nests of, of adherent microbiota, um, can it be done by laser capture? I, I think it's a really exciting uh, direction that we haven't even attempted yet. Um, what we found was, and we argued that the microbiome signature might shape the development of polyps, both, both in a forward and a reverse direction, a positive and negative direction. Uh, what we found in this study was that uh, there were two microbiome clusters associated with the burn crypt foci. Uh, a cluster A and B. And when we looked and stratified the, the presence of these different taxa within the lesions, what we found was that a, a certain clear distinction could be seen between normal mucosa as well as ACF that had no synchronous polyp in the colon. However, when, when a patient had not only ACF but a polyp synchronous as well, uh, either a, a benign hyperplastic polyp or a more significant tubular adenoma, we began to see differences in microbiota. Uh, a, a sessile straight adenoma, we had an exciting hint that there may actually be a different subcluster of microbiome uh, cluster B associated with sessile straight adenomas, but we need to do many, many more samples to, to really uh, figure that out. Finally, on the right side, we did find a, uh, something quite, quite interesting that a, depending on the somatic mutation underlying the aberrant foci or microadenoma, there was actually different colonization of bacteria. And in the case of APC, we found S intestinobacter. And in the case of KRAS, we found ruminococcus navis. Whether or not these bacterial associations are driving the somatic mutation or contra uh, conversely, uh, the, 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 the somatic mutation is, is attracting these, these bacteria, we don't know at this point. So uh, how much more time do I have? I've lost track of time. Uh, you have about five more minutes. Five more minutes. So now we're going to look at the epithelial stroma immune microenvironment using a different targeted AmpleSeq approach. Uh, Dr. Takayasu 
Edetta, who is a gastroenterologist from the Gifu Institute in Japan, uh, did most of this work uh, along with Bo Yang Li, who did a lot of the bio bioinformatics. So we used what was what is was developed by Thermo Fisher, the Oncoimmune Re Re Response Research Assay, uh, which is about 400 genes that are curated for looking at inflammation and, and immune cell signal. And the first thing that we did, just as some little background, 10 ACF lesions, or, or actually microadenomas from distal colon were microdissected, uh, sequenced uh, to, to greater than uh, 1 million reads per sample. And we developed expression profiles from these, these uh, 400 gene array. And uh, again, using laser capture microdissection, a proximal ACF is shown on the left, and then some PCA plots to show separation, again, of the four different groupings, the, uh, the epithelia of normal in, uh, in ACF and, and stroma of normal in ACF. What we found by this heat map was that 88 differentially expressed genes were found in the epithelium, 82 differentially expressed genes in the stroma. These would include both up and down regulated uh, gene expression changes. What really surprised us was the number one on the left uh, at the top was PDCD1 or, or PD1, which is an important checkpoint uh, inhibitor um, that affects T cell function. And that was the most upregulated within the epithelial compartment. So this, this summarizes some of the significant changes. This work is all uh, in press right now at Molecular Cancer Research, and it should come out within the next uh, several months. Um, but what we saw was in the stroma, some of the top differentially expressed genes were, again, P16, CDKN2A, which was up 17-fold, and then TWIST1 and KLFR1 were both down about 100-fold in the stroma. In the epithelium, uh, CDKN2A was actually down 12-fold, uh, and, and some of the upregulated were, as I said, PC, PD1 or PDCD1, which, which was up 10-fold, uh, CXCL1 and CXCL8 were both up five-fold, and S100A9 was up five and a half-fold. Those are all important inflammatory signaling molecules. Uh, looking more closely at the PD-1 uh, effect, we did some immunofluorescence co-localizing PD-1 with CD-8 expression uh, in, the, in the epithelial, uh, as you can see, the crypts of the colon. And what we found was there was actually a big increase in epithelial CD-8 PD-1 positive cells uh, in, in the dysplasia around or within uh, the, the, the ACF lesion. Uh, most likely, these are tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, TILs, that are beginning to become affected by PD, PD-1 activation. So the, uh, to summarize this finding, the immune checkpoint and T-cell exhaustion gene was one of the most significantly upregulated genes. And we found that was accompanied by decreased cytotoxic T-cell effector gene expression, which you will see um, in the overall gene list that is that will be published uh, in, in a few months. And this does suggest to us there's a potential suppression of immune surveillance. So just summarizing the results from the oncoimmune panel, uh, uh, the, the cartoon on the left tells you some of the uh, most significantly upregulated inflammatory genes in the, uh, within the epithelial layer, uh, the changes going on within the stroma, and, and some things that we think probably are driving fibroblast senescence as well. So just to end my talk with the next two slides, uh, now we're beginning to combine in some work with Fluidyme, uh, LCM expression profiling with imaging mass cytometry, or, or as Lance mentioned, the CYTOF approach for looking at uh, multiplex imaging within, within, the, within the tissue microenvironment. And we're just beginning this project. Uh, it was funded from the, the NCI several months ago uh, through their provocative program question, and we're looking at early onset colorectal cancer. And for, for doing this study, we're going to be looking at colorectal cancers. And we've collected about five early onset and five late onset so far. We're going to look at advanced adenomas, and we're looking at uh, at aberrant crypt foci as well. And from this study, we're going to be grow, or we are growing organic or organoid and fibroblast culture systems from early and late onset cancers, as well as doing LCM on the tissues to do uh, the biomark real time PCR analysis from fluidime. And then some of our samples will be used for imaging mass cytometry 
uh, uh, the multiplex imaging. And this is just a panel of immuno-oncology markers that are already available from Fluidyme for doing this type of approach. And the question would, and, and this is actually some, some new data from Fluidyme on comparing adjacent normal colon and colon adenocarcinomas, looking at immune profiles using Cytoph um, and, and a number of specific immune cell markers like CD4, CD8, CD3, uh, CHI-67 on, on human FFP tissues. And this is what we will be doing for early and late onset cancers. So the rationale for this, this is my last slide, is by combining LCM with uh, profiling with I IMC, uh, I think this might give us very, very sensitive methods for better understanding the tumor microenvironment uh, that could take into account complex network signaling between all the different cell types that are present. Uh, the IMC, of course, will provide an understanding of spatial relationships between all these different cell types uh, within the context of the disease. Um, the LCM allows a detailed understanding of cell activity, of course, by further characterizing the cell types present and differences uh, within the cells. And finally, combining the transcriptomic and phenotypic understanding of a heterogeneous microenvironment at single cell resolution. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, I'm open to questions as well.